speaker program that we have done in the past. Um, uh, it's kind of every so often throughout the year. We're trying to make this a little bit more of a regular thing, uh, maybe once every quarter. Uh, we're still working on that. Uh, we're a pretty small group, so you know this is a really, really important thing, I think, for uh, the community to get to come and listen to people talk about um, things that are important in their watershed uh, near where they live. So, just again, thank you guys for being here. Um, Thad Scott, who a lot of you already know, he graciously agreed to talk about Lake Fayetteville. He knows a lot about Lake Fayetteville. I know because I used to work for him. Uh, I've spent a lot of time on Lake Fayetteville, uh, working on projects, and uh, if anybody knows about the science in you know going on with the lake, it, it's this guy, and he has uh, written a lot of papers, uh, done a lot of studies uh, about nutrient cycling in this lake uh, and a bunch of other lakes and rivers. So, um, yeah, that's it. I mean, I can give you a, I can give you a whole bio on him. Uh, I don't know some true. some of the things you probably don't want me to tell you, but uh, <laughs> or, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'll sit down. I'll keep it simple. All right, thanks, Dad. Thank you, Brian. Thank you all for having me. Um, right there. I'm going to see if I can use this thing to advance the slides, and I'm going to try not to stand in anyone's way, but shout at me. if I, I tend to roam, so uh, don't, don't let me get in your way. Okay, so the talk today is going to be, why does Lake Fayetteville look like this a lot of the time? And is there anything that we can, anything that we can do about it, really? Um... So, uh, an overview of what I'll talk about, um, I'm just going to outline or review for most of you the, just the concept of accelerated eutrophication in lakes, um, then I'm going to talk about a common model that we use to quantify and understand how eutrophication works um, in lakes. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about factors controlling nutrient inputs, and then I'll close with some management options, hopefully some of which will be uh, relevant to Lake Fayetteville. Okay, so uh, first thing I wanted to point out is this is the this is sort of the picture that, that did it a few years back, how I got involved with this with the partnership. Uh, the the lake the um, what was it the solar boat races used to be on Lake Fayetteville, and they never had them again after this year here. Uh, these were they were sc scraping away the algal scums near the boat ramp and then they never came back again. Um, so eutrophication is a big problem in this lake. Um, but honestly, it's been a, lot, a big problem for a long time. One thing we have access to at the U of A is a number of theses and dissertations that have been written about Lake Fayetteville over the years, and this one dating back to 1975, where you see some of the common things that we measure about eutrophication 40 years ago and now are basically the same. This lake has been bad for a long time. The secchi depth in 1975 was 0.8 meters. Average chlorophyll A concentration was 30 micrograms per liter. And this is the aerial hypolimetic oxygen deficit. It's about 0.1, and it's about 0.1 in 2010 as well when we measured it. So water quality in the lake has been bad for a long time, arguably worse of late. Um, here is a common dissolved oxygen profile for Lake Fayetteville, the blue line being 1975, the red line July 2010, and you can see the interesting thing about this lake, or um, unfortunate thing, is that when you get to about three meters depth, three meters below the lake surface, there's no oxygen in the water. Um, and that's true each summer. Um, it, it loses its oxygen very rapidly compared to most lakes um, in the area, and that's because it's so, so productive. Um, the dominant algae, what make the water green, haven't changed much in 40 years. Two of these genera, Aphanazomena and Anabina, um, are both really problematic, toxic, toxin-producing algae. They were here 40 years ago, they're here now. This one um, is a new one, Cylindrus Vermont, has been invading North America uh, for about the last decade, and it's in Lake Fayetteville now, has been found in Lake Fayetteville now, and it's one of particular concern as well. Okay, so what causes eutrophication? You guys already know this pretty, pretty well, but I'll just remind you that it's primarily nutrients, primarily plant nutrients like phosphorus. Um, so this is sort of the classic demonstration that phosphorus causes eutrophication. A lake in the Experimental Lakes area of Canada had two major basins. They put a screen separating the two basins so water didn't mix between them. 
One basin they left alone as an experimental control, the other they enriched it with phosphorus, and the result is, is pretty obvious and striking what happens. So for most lakes, phosphorus is the primary control on eutrophication, and it's the same, as I'm going to show you in a bit, uh, for Lake Fayetteville. So one of the things we want to know is how do we measure phytoplankton biomass? Phytoplankton are the microscopic plants that live in this lake along with every other lake in the world. Um, and they're what make the lake green. Uh, and they're a good thing. Phytoplankton are a good thing. They're the base of the food web. They are what are eaten by the next largest thing called zooplankton. Those get eaten by small fish and big fish eat the small fish, right? Um, so they're the base. We want them. Uh, but we don't want too much of them. And one important thing to do in terms of quantifying eutrophication is being able to actually just quantify the amount of algae, phytoplankton, in the lake. You can do it a few, several different ways. Um, one way that's um, sort of interesting and fun scientifically is to get a microscope and visualize them. And you can even measure them. You can measure how long the filaments are, how wide they are, and then you can count how many of them are, and you can come up with an estimate of their biomass based on that. The problem with this technique for quantifying biomass, it's difficult, time consuming, and it's really inaccurate. It doesn't give you very good results, okay? So we in our lab uh, don't typically use that measurement very much. We use a much simpler approach. We uh, measure the uh, pigment chlorophyll A, same pigment that's in trees on plant, uh, leaves on trees, it's in those particular organisms as well. So here's this guy when he was a little bit younger. Look at that young. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> filtering a sample. So we just take a water sample from the lake. We, we put a known volume onto a filter, capture it on the filter, take that filter, put it into some acetone, extract the chlorophyll, and then we take that extracted chlorophyll and we measure it on a, on a fluorometer. So the great thing about this it's very fast and easy to do, but more importantly, it is highly accurate and very, very, very quantitative. So it gives us a really great measurement of how much algae is in the lake for not much work at all. So in our lab, we measure a lot of different things. Um, here's just a short list, and you can, um, in addition to a lot of other things that we also measure, um, but all these methods are in this book, Standard Methods for the Examination of Water and Wastewater. Um, and I'm not going to talk about all these today. I'm going to focus on two measurements today that explain something about the um, eutrophication of Lake Fayetteville and, and other lakes too. Um, and that's just total phosphorus and chlorophyll A concentration. So these two measurements together are what have been used in a very simple model to quantify eutrophication and then ultimately make management decisions about lakes. And so I'm going to show you that model here. It was first developed by some limnologists um, Dillon and Riggler and published in 1974, so this is really this is a really well-established science, 40 years old. Um, notice a couple of things. This graph, the values on this graph are on log scale, so every tick mark that you see on the graph is an order of magnitude, 1, 10, 100, 1,000, the same with phosphorus. It's increasing by orders of magnitude, not by 1, 2, 3, 4, okay? That's really important. Second thing is, look how tight this relationship is. It's a really, really, really strong predictive relationship. These are the annual average phytoplankton measured as chlorophyll A and the annual average total phosphorus concentrations in these lakes um, uh, against each other. So um, the great thing about having a quantitative relationship like this is you can use a, you just you can go back and make a line out of the data and we can have the equation for that line be a predictive model. And so this is the model, this is the equation that is, describes this particular, this particular model. So it tells us for any concentration of total phosphorus in the lake, we can predict how much algal biomass will be there, and vice versa. We can rearrange the equation. If we know how much algal biomass is there, we can predict how much total phosphorus was there to control it, right? Um, and that's a very uh, useful thing. So, for example, you uh, may, I'm sure all of you are familiar with, um, the only water quality standard for chlorophyll in the state of Arkansas, phytoplankton biomass in the state of Arkansas, is Beaver Lake. It's the only one that exists in our water quality regulations. And the standard is 8 micrograms per liter. 
if, if this model works for Beaver Lake, we don't have a phosphorus standard for Beaver Lake, but effectively we do because we have this model. And it turns out that's, that standard for Beaver Lake is 0.019 milligrams per liter. If the phosphorus concentration gets above that, we're going to have more <coughs> algal biomass than is acceptable by law. Okay? So a really useful, useful thing. So what I wanted to do tonight here was to see if this model... Again, this model was built primarily, if I, I didn't say this, I meant to. This model was built based on data from North Temperate Lakes. So these are all natural lakes it was built from, not reservoirs like we have here, um, and not like Lake Theodore or Beaver Lake. So what I want to do is put this in context into lakes in Northwest Arkansas for a couple of reasons. One, to see if the model works for those lakes. And two, so that you can be able to get to see some context between other lakes in the region, which you've probably all been to, and Lake Fayetteville. Okay? So here's, uh, this graph is going to stay like this for a while. Here's the chlorophyll A standard for Beaver Lake. Uh, this is the value uh, for each of these locations as they pop up. There's Beaver Lake at the dam, really low phosphorus concentrations, and really low out phytoplankton biomass. Here's Beaver Lake at Highway 12, so you work your way upstream um, all the way uh, to Rogers area. Uh, here is Beaver Lake near Lowell, if you're familiar with that. That's the uh, Beaver Water District intake location on the lake. Uh, this is Beaver Lake at Hickory Creek. Sorry, it's kind of running off the screen over there. That's Hickory Creek. This is actually where the water quality standard for Beaver Lake applies. So you can see, here's the standard, and here's the water quality value, at least measured over the last decade or so. Um, it's exceeding it already. Okay? Um, and then lastly, here is Beaver Lake at Highway 412. So this is all the way up at the Twin Bridges. Um, uh, no, 412, not Twin Bridges. 412, like you're going um, uh, what, what east out of here, basically. Okay? So a couple of things to note. The, boy, these, these lines, they just line up, these points line up perfectly on this line, with the exception of this kind of falling off a little bit at the upper end. Um, so now I'm going to show you some data for other lakes that are more similar in size to Lake Fayetteville. One thing to notice about Beaver Lake is that these increasing concentrations is basically working your way upstream from the dam. Okay, so as you get into the river, we expect the lakes to be more productive up there, and indeed it is. So the rest of these data are for other reservoirs that we've been working on um, in the past uh, seven, five or seven years um, through time. So here are three lakes in Bella Vista. Uh, this is Lake Brittany, Lake Norwood, and Lake Rayburn, if you're familiar with those locations, the relationship between total phosphorus and, and chlorophyll A. Uh, here's Lake Weddington, which is a U.S. Forest Service lake just on the west side of Fayetteville in, in the Weddington National Forest. Uh, here's Lake Elmdale, uh, which is a lake it's very similar to Lake Fayetteville, but owned and operated by the Game and Fish Commission out by Elm Springs. And here's where you don't want to guess where Lake Fayetteville is. I'm ready to show you Lake Fayetteville. How bad is it? It's not going to be as bad as you think. Lake Fayetteville um, is really similar to Lake Elmdale, actually. So a couple of things to point out. Um, the, again, these are orders of magnitude change in both of these variables. And the other thing that sort of becomes obvious if you kind of tilt your head and twist a little bit is that these, these two variables are very proportional amongst all these lakes, which is not surprising at all. They follow this model, but the slope of the line is just a little bit different. So when we model just the northwest Arkansas lakes, the slope of the line becomes slightly smaller. But because these are orders of magnitude, this slightly smaller is a big, big change. Okay, so now I'm going to take the same plot and I'm going to move it back out to linear space, which is going to make these lines curvy, okay, and the data are going to kind of spread out a little bit, but hopefully it'll be clear what I'm doing, okay? So same data, but now I'm moving it to linear space. Okay, so the point here is that at really low phosphorus concentrations, there's not much difference at all in the model we developed for Northwest Arkansas Ozark Lakes and the model uh, that Dylan and Riggler developed back in 1974. It's only whenever we get out to total phosphorus concentrations above about 0 0.02, 0 
or 20 micrograms per liter that we start to see these two data sets <coughs> diverging a bit. Okay, so for this, for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to base what I'm going to say might be management recommendations on this line because I think it's a better representation of what's going on in Ozark lakes. And it has to do, I'm not going to talk about these details tonight, although I'll try to answer questions for it if you want me to. It has to do with the fact that these lakes, our Ozark lakes, become very strongly nitrogen limited in the summer. And that's just typically not true of many natural lakes in the temperate north. Okay? So we use this dashed line, and we actually come up with an equation that represents it um, on a log scale again. So it's a power function where we're, we're raising TP to a power here, um, which is what makes that line curvy. Um, and then we can go back and we can measure or we can model based on any chlorophyll concentration in any of these lakes or any desired chlorophyll concentration what the TP concentration, that the total phosphorus concentration needs to be in that lake to achieve that desired phytoplankton biomass. So let's just do that for here. So let's just say, based on the current value of chlorophyll A in Lake Fayetteville, what we, um, the model value that we get is 0.054 milligrams per liter. If we go to Highway 412 on Beaver Lake, uh, the model total phosphorus concentration is 0.029. Uh, Lake Weddington, it's 0 .021. Uh, Beaver at Highway 12 is 0 .013. Okay, so what this tells you is, by context, you can say this. If I want Lake Fayetteville to look like Beaver Lake at Highway 412, we've got to reduce the uh, total phosphorus concentration uh, by about 25.025 milligrams per liter. Okay, uh, if we want it to look like Beaver Lake at Highway 12, we've got to reduce it by 40, or 0 0.04 milligrams per liter. I'm sorry, I keep going back between micrograms per liter and milligrams per liter. So when I say 40, I'm just talking about a different kind of unit. Okay, so those don't seem like much, right? It doesn't seem like much to go from 0 0.054 to 0 0.013. It doesn't seem like much of a change in concentration, does it? Uh, but indeed, it's huge in terms of the amount of algal biomass that you see in a lake. Okay? Okay, so what controls the concentrations of total phosphorus in all lakes, not just Beaver Lake, but all lakes? Um, this talk sort of coincided well with a paper that I'm working on right now um, with some colleagues when we have this diagram in it. And it's really, the paper is intended to show what may happen with um, the projections that are, the climate projections that are coming out in response to climate change, uh, which, in, which, which involve um, very intense storms versus very long droughts. Um, and I'm not going to go into the details of this right now, but I just want to use this diagram for the purposes of explaining what the sources of nutrients are to these lakes. Uh, really, it's just two things. It boils down to two categories of nutrient sources, and that is external versus internal loading. External loading is exactly what you might think about um, normal nutrient loading. This is nutrient loading that comes from the watershed. Could be point source, could be non-point source. In the Lake Fayetteville watershed, it's non-point source. It has to be because there aren't, there aren't any point source discharges that I'm aware of, at least, in the watershed. Um, the other issue with nutrient loading in the Lake Fayetteville is internal loading. That simply means not rather than coming from the watershed, something that's coming from within. So as nutrients get washed into the lake, they fuel algal growth. That algae settles and deposits into the sediments. It mineralizes and releases phosphorus back into the water column. And we'll talk a little bit about that more. When it, that phosphorus mineralizes and releases back to the water column, that's called internal loading. It could be a really important source. So if we could somehow turn the source off of the watershed, just magically make all the phosphorus from the watershed disappear, we would still have a significant source of phosphorus in the lake because of all that's washed in already. Okay? So management has to address both of these. So my students and I have been working on trying to quantify the nutrient budget for Lake Fayetteville for some time. And this is work um, published recently by this young lady, Erin Grants, um, uh, she did a full nutrient budget for lakes Fayetteville, Elmdale, and Weddington uh, comparatively. 
Um, and so she measured all these fluxes simultaneously. But the only one that you're really interested in are the watershed phosphorus loads. This is the external load and the internal load um, that are fueling algal growth, those two squares. So when you look those up, the external load that she measured was about 7.1 grams phosphorus per meter square per year. The internal load was 1.1. So this external load made up 87% of the phosphorus inputs on an annual basis, and only 13% came from the internal load. By the way, if you're wandering in context, this is a huge, huge, huge number. Enormous. It doesn't get much higher than this in the world uh, in terms of phosphorus loading to a load. Um, okay, why is that? Why is the phosphorus loading rate in this lake so darn high? The answer is actually really simple. Um, we have a watershed that probably at one time was 90 some odd percent forest and now is 10 percent forest. Um, since that time, the watershed has gone through some interesting changes. Primarily it was cleared and turned into pasture to begin with. That pasture probably received, I'm saying probably, I think probably is a good word to use, probably see a tremendous amount of soil amendments from broiler litter and then has gone undergone in the last few years really rapid urbanization. And that's sort of an important double whammy that's happening for this. So that's what's controlling the external load. Now if we think about how that works in terms of phosphorus leaving the soil and washing into the lake, we actually know how it works really really well. Not we, uh, this guy. Uh, Andrew Sharpley, who is my colleague, a colleague in my department, um, he ha he wrote, he was a co-author on this paper, Nonpoint Source Pollution of Surface Waters with Nitrogen and Phosphorus, which in the science circles that I run around in is an enormously important paper. It's been cited over 3,000 times. It's enormously uh, important and, and discipline-changing paper, right? And his contribution to that paper was to relate the soil phosphorus concentrations to the concentration of dissolved phosphorus in runoff. And if you look at these values, it's really interesting. Basically, as the soil tests phosphorus, this malic extractable soil phosphorus goes up, the runoff dissolved phosphorus also goes up. Um, but the more important thing is, put those two, uh, put that, those values of that runoff phosphorus in the context of what fuels algal growth. In other words, Compare this axis, which we know is what controls algal biomass in the lake, to this axis, which is coming out of these different soil types. Okay? Dissolved P, 0 0.51, 1.52 milligrams per liter. Total phosphorus down here, 0 0.02, 0 0.04, 0 0.06, 0 0.08. We're talking about this scale fits about right here. Okay? And I would challenge you to find probably... I'd be interested to see if anyone could meet this challenge. Any soil test P in this watershed that's less than 100. You might find some. You might find some 80s, maybe a 60 or two. They're high. We don't really know. So this is a big problem, big, big problem for this watershed, OK? So now, so that's external load. That's the watershed load. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about internal load because this is a really important thing for eutrophication. Internal load, eutrophication is a self-perpetuating process because of this. Turns out that phosphorus has a very um, complex geochemistry that is related to oxygen availability. So when in, in lake sediments that look like this, lake sediments that are always flooded are always anoxic. There's, when you get into the sediments, there's no oxygen present. And the reason why is because there are microbes in there and they're sucking the oxygen out real fast, faster than the oxygen can get into the, to the sediments. And what that does is it creates a lot of reduced iron. This kind of iron is called ferrous iron. And then whenever you get to the top part of these sediments, where there's water that has oxygen over the top of them, the, the sediment water interface has oxidized iron. This iron 3 is called ferric iron. Okay, So what happens is ferric iron grabs onto P and does not let go, never lets go of it. It's a really great P trap. Okay, Ferrous iron, when it's reduced, there's no oxygen available, just lets go of it altogether. So this little loop in oxidized lake sediments where there's 
oxygen, oxygenated water overlying the sediments is called Ferris wheel. the Ferris wheel. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and when lakes become eutrophic, the bottom of them, like I showed you earlier for Lake Fayetteville, the bottom of them becomes completely anoxic in the summertime. All the oxygen goes away. When you have anoxic water, there's no ferric iron to be had anywhere anymore. So all of this phosphorus that's in the sediment is just plunging out of uh, the sediments and fueling more eutrophication, right? So it's a self-perpetuating self process. As soon as the lake goes anoxic in the hypolimbian, in the lower water layer, you've got more phosphorus to fuel more algal growth, which is troublesome. So here's some data to show that. Here's that uh, those oxygen profiles that I showed you earlier. Three meters down, we've got no oxygen in the lake. Here is the pho dissolved phosphorus concentration of the hypolimnium in Lake Fayetteville that we've measured over one particular summer. Um, notice again, this is on a log scale, 0 0.01, 0 0.11 milligrams per liter. Again, compare that to these here, these values here. So these values really stretch right in here, the lowest values we measured over the whole summer. So the internal load is really also really significant in terms of fueling algal growth as well. Okay, so what can we do about it? It seems hopeless, doesn't it? And I don't want to, I don't, I don't want to paint too hopeless nor too rosy of a picture, because something can be done, uh, but not very easily. Uh, so here are the same paper that I was telling you about earlier. Here are eight management options for addressing algal blooms and lakes. Um, so I think these are all really timely uh, for Lake Fayetteville. So I'm going to go through these individually one by one and talk to you about them, and then we can discuss them maybe with questions. Okay, the very first one, by far the most important, is reducing nitrogen and phosphorus that comes from the watershed, without a doubt. The very most important thing that needs to be done to have an effect. The best way to do that is by using this, the Arkansas Phosphorus Index, which is already being applied in this watershed because it's a a nutrient surplus region of Arkansas. So this index does a few things. It, it calculates an index that tells you if and how much litter or fertilizer can be applied to land. And it does it by looking at the source potential, how much phosphorus is in the source, the transport potential of the landscape that you're putting it on, and then if you have any BMPs in place on your landscape. Okay. So the source materials are the ones you might think of. Litter, um, dry litter not treated, dry litter tre treated, liquid manure, biosolids, things like that. They have scores that go into this index. Okay. The next thing is the phosphorus transport potential. This is things like erosion potential, runoff category, flooding frequency, application method of litter. Those get calculated to come with a part of the index as well. And then lastly, what BMPs are, are in place on your property? Do you have terraces? Do you have a pond? Is the pond fenced off from cattle so they can't um, uh, cause more soil erosion? All of these different categories that feed into the P-index. That P-index helps you determine what can be done on your particular property. Okay. So again, I just want to remind you about this watershed. This watershed has the double whammy of having had a legacy of high P application through litter, which is true of our entire landscape in North of Arkansas, not just this watershed. Um, but because of where this watershed is located, it's also got the double whammy of rapid urbanization. And I don't have any data to prove this, but I've been talking for a long time about how I think this is really the foundational crux of the problems that are in Lake Fayetteville. Um, because legacy pea in the soil and then clearing land, even removing the pastures to build developments, is just a dangerous, dangerous combination. Okay, so that's runoff. I'll get off my high horse about that. <laughs> Second thing, increased flushing. This is not applicable to Lake Fayetteville. And the reason why is because you've got to have an upstream source of water that you can control to allow flushing of the lake. There's no such thing in this watershed, so that one doesn't apply here. Third one is enhanced mixing. One of the things that these, al these harmful algae do is they put oxygen into their cells. It allows them to float to the surface and grab more sunlight, gives them a competitive advantage. Um, and one thing that can be done is you can force them out of the floating zone by pushing them down with enhanced mixing. And it's done with equipment like this called um, 
solar powered circulators. There's a company called Solar Bee that does this. These are just solar powered, and there's a little upwelling panel here, and it just forces water around the lake, forces the algae out of the photic zone where they can't photosynthesize it effectively. The second thing this could kind of do for a lake like Lake Fayetteville is it could make a big difference on the oxygen dynamics in the lake. Remember, the lake is stratified down to this level, but the there's no oxygen even up into the upper layer of the lake on a still day. Um, so if you install an enhanced mixing unit like this one, it's going to move that water around and presumably could have a big effect on the dissolved oxygen in the upper mix layer. That could help with mineralization of organic matter, which is a really good thing. So I think this is a viable option for the lake. Third thing is food, or fourth thing is food web manipulations. The jury's out on this one. I don't know much about this one. This guy tried to do a little bit of this kind of work. Um, primarily looking to see whether the zooplankton in this lake effectively fed on the algae that lived in the lake. And what he found was, yeah, pretty much they do, because their chemical signatures look really similar to each other. But it, historically, or in the literature, we know that these kinds of organisms don't feed on these kind of algae very well, because they're just too big. They prefer to have these. So what we did know was happening is maybe if the chemical signature from these was just getting transferred to the small algae too, which were being eaten by the zooplankton. And I'm still waiting on him to finalize all that work, so we'll know the answer. So you can just stay on him, so we'll know the answer about that. Okay, so food wet manipulations. Upstream wetland development, probably not a very good option for this lake because the, new, the external loads that come into the lake come in so fast in so few events that slow, you're not really going to slow it down in a wet house, okay? If there's a, sometimes if there was a, a, if there was a point source upstream and that was the main problem, a wetland might work well because it's just filtering out what's coming in nice and slow and constant. But when it all comes from non-point source, it's just a huge push with a rain event and a wetland just gets blown out. Can't do anything, okay? Chemical treatments. Don't waste your time or money or effort on this. Don't put copper sulfate in this lake. Don't do it. It's a bad idea. Um, you just you're just putting a band-aid on an arterial cut to do that. It won't help you. You're just wasting your money. Um, macrophyte growth. I think this actually has some potential in this lake. Um, the problem is going to be that the second transparency is not very deep at all. So you have to start very shallow with rooted and floating vegetation and work your way out to deeper vegetation. But the literature has pretty clearly shown this, the scientific literature has pretty clearly shown this. As nutrients increase, the turbidity in lakes that have vegetation is typically just lower than lakes that don't have vegetation. Right? So for any particular nutrient level, without vegetation, it's a more turbid lake. With vegetation, it's less turbid. Um, so I think this is a good option. More importantly, it's cheap, and you can do it with volunteer hours. Last thing. Uh, sediment capping and sediment dredging. You get a lot of questions about this. I've got to, let's see if this will work. Oh, shoot. Where's the mouse? Oh, I've got the mouse in my hand. How about that? Oh. Of course it won't work when I'm so technology. Um, okay, this is a treatment going on in Lake Worcester, Oklahoma, and they're putting alum in the lake to cap the sediments from phosphorus release. And so it's kind of hard to see, but I just wanted you to see what, what it looked like to be able to do something like this at this scale. These are tanks full of alum. They, in this particular part, they only did it in one part of the lake that's probably about the size of Lake Fayetteville, and it took, I think, 18 tractor trailer loads of alum to do it. And that was a light dose. And I, I think it cost about $100,000 to, to be able to do it. So that's what it looked like, okay? Uh, the other options are just getting the sediment out of the lake, right? Um, there's two ways to do that. You can drain the lake, completely draw it down, drive your tractors out there, scoop it all out, haul it out, and you're good. Or you can put it, something on a barge and you can scoop it out that way. Both of these options are hard and expensive to do. So those are the options. Um, that's the patterns. Here are my recommendations. Uh, number one, prioritize external nutrient input reductions. Uh, that has got to be your number one priority. You guys are already doing that through the work with the county extension that Colin's doing and John did before him. That is the right approach. You need to double down on it. You need to do as much of that and more if possible. 
And then secondly, identify what you want to do with the lake. Um, I think there are several options here that are good. Um, enhanced mixing is a poss possible option. Certainly, macrophyte um, uh, management is a really viable option for this lake. Sediment camping with alum might be a viable option for this lake. But all of those three things, I wouldn't invest in any of them until I've made more investments in number one. Okay? All right, well, that's all I have. Now I'll open it up for questions, and I'll just point out this question mark comes from also comes from Brian. I, I, this was this was an homage to Brian. This whole presentation. <laughs> this is the uh, two colonies of the harmful algae Microcystis, which you don't want in your lake. That's in Lake Fayetteville, um, and it in the form of a question mark. All right. Yeah.